class of 2011, we have uh, Michael Fries. He's currently a senior development manager at Blake Real Estate. They are a well-known uh, investor and developer of DC area real estate. Uh, from the class of 2007, we have Kevin Setzer. He's currently a senior vice president at Hogan Companies, a diversified land development and brokerage company. And uh, last but not least, uh, from the class of 2001, we have uh, Mark Shaver. Um, he's senior vice president of business strategy and health systems initiatives at Well Tower, uh, one of the largest owners of healthcare real estate in the world. Um, so guys, it's great to have you. Uh, I'll kick it off to Michael first to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Hey guys, uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, Chandler, I know you said 2011, that was my grad degree. So I'm a, a few years older than that. I was 2005 <laughs> on the undergrad side. There we um, go. Yeah, but uh, guys, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm a long-term Maryland guy. I've been born and raised here in Montgomery County, just around the Beltway from College Park. Um, spent basically my entire life right here in, in, in Lower Maryland, in and around uh, the college campus and, and the real estate market here. So uh, after graduating with my undergrad in mechanical engineering, uh, I actually went to work for a local general contractor. So my my roots in real estate are actually physically from a construction site in the field, working with skilled tradesmen, um, truly learning and understanding what it physically takes to build a project. Uh, may that be, uh, you know, a, an 11 story high rise or, or, you know, a bridge or whatever it may be. So my understanding and focus in construction is, in real estate is more on the construction development side, uh, physical development operations. Um, 2011 was when I graduated with my MBA. So I parlayed my, my undergrad in engineering into an MBA from the Smith School as well. Um, from there is where I kind of springboarded from the GC side to the owner side um, and began my career working for owner developers, not necessarily building for owners, but actually managing general contractors, managing design, managing architects um, in terms of putting a, the whole process together, not just from a physical construction standpoint, but also a permanent entitlement standpoint um, as well as the design and administration as well. So uh, it's a little bit about me uh, and kind of what will uh, frame kind of my understanding and framework about my answers and responses to today's panel. So uh, appreciate the time and uh, I'll kick it over to Kevin. Thanks, Michael. Um, Kevin Setzer, I'm a 2007 uh, Smith School grad. Um, I also had a degree in finance, uh, was involved with the Quest program as well, which is uh, kind of an interdisciplinary teams uh, based program. Um, I think I was cohort 12 in that group and it's always crazy to get the emails now and see cohort 25 or 30 or whatever they're on now. So it's, it's uh, going by quick. Um, I started with the Hogan companies as an intern actually in 2005 um, between my sophomore and junior years, um, took an internship, uh, replied to an ad that was posted on the Smith School's uh, career website. Um, you know, basically spent the summer cold calling property owners and landowners asking if they were interested in selling property. Uh, I absolutely hated it. Uh, completely, um, you know, out of my comfort zone, completely uh, not knowing anything about real estate at the time. But, you know, I think it did really set a, a good kind of base for my career moving forward. Um, the following winter break, um, I got my real estate license and continued on throughout the, the school year. Um, you know, senior year, I worked three days a week full time at Hogan Companies down in Annapolis, um, you know, up until graduation. Uh, 2007, you know, was a really hot time in real estate. Um, I left college with probably a $30 million pipeline of, of deals under contract moving towards closing. Then, you know, all of these land deals and transactions that I typically work on take, you know, anywhere from two to 10 years to go through the approvals process. And 2009 and 10, 11 were not great years in real estate. So uh, it was a really interesting time to, you know, kind of hit the ground running with uh, my full-time career. Um, about 2013, I got a little burnt out in real estate after that, that tough slog with the great recession. So um, I actually took a hiatus from Hogan companies. I got my series seven and 66 uh, investment advisor licenses and work part-time with uh, Wells Fargo advisors as a financial advisor. Um, you know, going from a very small 10 person kind of boutique real estate firm to, you know, a giant behemoth financial services company uh, was a big difference, big change. 
uh, ultimately decided that I much more preferred the small entrepreneurial side of real estate uh, than the financial advising side. So came back to Hogan Companies in 2014, uh, which was another pretty interesting time to move on because our founder, uh, Larry Hogan, uh, then was elected governor of Maryland. So we loaned him out for several years to, uh, you know, hopefully continue to improve the state. And, um, you know, here we are today. It's it's been an interesting several years and, um, you know, looking forward to having a discussion about, um, you know, what the real estate market's been like over the past couple of years and, and what we do more. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. Great to be here. Uh, I'm Mark Shaver. Uh, I'm class of 2001 from the Smith School uh, that I did my MBA at, at Maryland. Um, I'm currently senior vice president at Well Tower. So for those of you who don't know Well Tower, where the largest publicly traded healthcare REIT uh, right now, post COVID, we're probably high 30 ish billion enterprise value. Pre COVID, we were, were much higher uh, in the, in the um, almost 50, $50 billion range. And so we're, we're essentially the largest owner of assisted living, independent living, memory care, skilled nursing, and uh, outpatient surgery. So anything that could and would be affected by the pandemic in terms of care for seniors, uh, we've experienced that. And you know, while, while we're here to talk about real estate, I, I actually come at this from a very different lens. I'm sort of a healthcare services, biz dev and, and relationship guy. I spent about 18 years at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, first 10 years or so was helping build partnerships overseas. Uh, and the last eight or nine years was doing sort of M&A health system partnerships. Um, so I come at this from a healthcare angle and, and met the CEO, the prior CEO of Well Tower, as part of that role. Um, and, and, and my job is really to wake up and think about what actually happens in our buildings. So uh, across our platform, we're, we're US, UK, and Canada. As, as Chandler said, we're an international firm. And we have plus or minus 200,000 seniors that live in those buildings uh, and get care every day. And so what we're trying to do is connect healthcare services, insurance services, other things to, to those seniors. You know, obviously my goal being a healthcare guy is to help improve healthcare outcomes, keep people safe, keep people thriving, but underlying is how do we drive the underlying value of the real estate? So, you know, keeping people living with us longer, driving occupancy in the building, the, the core principles that you all think about in terms of real estate fundamentals is, is what we try to achieve. My role is just to how do you manifest that from, from a health perspective. So super excited to be here today. Uh, really uh, proud, proud to serve alone. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm just going to jump into some questioning here. So uh, first question for everyone would be, uh, what was your first real estate experience? What was something that made you realize that real estate could be a potential career path? Michael, feel free to start it off or yeah, I'll jump any, right anyone could take it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I, I, you know, I introduced, uh, you know, myself, my background is coming from the trades. And, and really, I think that's where I really fell in love with, with, with real estate was actually from the field and the trades. I mean, I loved watching the, the, you know, the projects that I was working on, you know, the, the decisions I was making on an everyday basis become tangible, right? I mean, so you're sitting there, you're planning a project for months or weeks, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, something pops up in front of you and there it stands. And so for me, what I really loved was the reward and the satisfaction associated with it being tangible. And I'm not trying to, you know, talk down to any of the tax accountants out there who file, you know, a bunch of returns at the end of the year and then shove them into a drawer and never think about them again. But I, for me, what I always loved and took satisfaction of early on in my career and still to this day is just the physical nature of the decisions and the projects that I work on and the ability to see them in front of me, um, and to see them grow almost like a child, right? You just see it go from this adolescence up into what becomes a functional you know, uh, uh, space for people to use and utilize and, and get value out of. Um, and so to this day, I'm, I, you know, I'm just, I love that aspect of it. I'm, I'm continuously driven by the ability to provide, you know, uh, uh, benefit and amenity to people through tangible construction and development. And I think, um, you know, when I first started at Maryland, I came in thinking I was going to be a, a stockbroker, um, you know, went through uh, 
some financial programs, uh, even in high school and, and coming into the business school, you know, being one of the best business schools around the area. Um, that was kind of what I thought I was going to do. Um, my father worked for the Maryland Department of the Environment, um, which is a very different side of, of the business than I'm at um, on the regulatory side, uh, regulating uh, wetlands and waterways throughout the state of Maryland. So, you know, we always talked about real estate tangentially through his, you know, experiences and working with developers. And so when I was an intern and I came across this, uh, this real estate posting, um, you know, it was something that kind of always was interesting in the background to me, not expecting it to be a full uh, real estate career that I wanted to embark on. Um, but very similar to, to Mike's experience, um, you know, the, the tangible side of, of real estate and being able to get out from behind a desk, go walk a, a property, um, you know, every day is, is never different or every day is different for me. No, no day is the same. Um, that's really kind of kept me coming back. I mean, there's no, uh, you know, I'm, I'm never dreading waking up and going to work in the morning. Um, you know, like I, I feel when, when I was at Wells Fargo Advisors, I, I did have that feeling and, and that was something that I didn't want uh, to do again. So the, the small aspect of the company I work for, being exposed to that really early on in my career, I, I was always a little, you know, in the back of my mind wondering, you know, whether the small company was a good fit for me because I'd never worked at a, a large company before. Um, but, you know, after trying it and coming back, uh, you know, I'll never go back to, you know, never kind of working for myself for, for a small company ever again. Yeah. Yeah. The, the culture of a small company is I, I, there's something to be said about that. I remember, you know, being back at, at Maryland and it was the summer before my junior year, I was interning for a, a real estate developer, just a one man kind of show in Pikesville. And he was uh, developing a standalone Starbucks drive through in Towson. And he's big on giving back to the community, but he did a ULI event. It was a walking tour of the Starbucks. And I think that was the first time where I kind of realized, you know, Michael, similar to what you said, I love Starbucks. If, if it can also be a great investment, you know, that's pretty cool that you can merge the two and you can see this, you know, in person. And uh, so it, it's, it's an investment kind of unlike anything else. And it's cool to have that tangible characteristic for sure. Yeah, I would just add, you know, everything you guys said resonates with me. My, my first experience is a little bit odd in, in um, probably around 2000, Hopkins had an opportunity to work on a project in Panama. Um, uh, and it was to work with who somebody who later became the minister of health to put a hospital in Panama. And actually you'd be surprised. There's a Hopkins co-branded hospital in Panama city, Panama. And my first trip, I was a kid, you know, 20 something year old kid. And they, we were walking around as Kevin shared, and it was a big piece of dirt in the middle of the city, right on the outskirts. And they were talking about a vision for a hospital, state-of-the-art hotel, you know, state-of-the-art mall for, for basically for Central America. And it was this major redesign. And, and I was sitting there as a young kid saying, how the hell are these guys going to pull this together? You know, we're, we're literally in a developing country, you know, challenge healthcare resources. How's this going to happen? And I will tell you today, if you landed in, in there, there's, there's a lot of people who say um, Panama is like Miami, only more people speak English. And uh, um, it is the most state-of-the-art healthcare, shopping, business experience. And seeing, you know, the ability of a concept to come together and in that instance, create a space where, where world-class healthcare can come together with world-class kind of environment, um, shopping, work, retail, sense of space. A lot of what we talk about today in terms of how do you transform retail using health and you know, creating places that people can thrive and live and play and work and get care. You know, some, to some degree, some of that came together back in early 2000s you know, with that project. So that was maybe the first time, I didn't maybe realize I would end up where I am today, but it was the first time, you know, Chandler, to your point that, that real estate and development and you know, all these things coming together piqued my interest. Yeah, See, seeing a big project like that in another country can just be, you know, so interesting and, and kind of ignite your interest. So, um, so uh, next question I have here, uh, biggest catalyst for pushing your career forward um, and, and why? So this could be, you know, a few different things. It could be a sort of a skill set you've developed or, or, you know, a relationship um, or a routine you have in or outside of work. Um, 
what would be the biggest catalyst for you guys in, in your career? Mark, you go first? Yeah, I'll start. I'll start. You know, <laughs> I would say, you know, the biggest thing from a career perspective, just thinking about careers, is the, the foundation of relationships, right? So a lot of this is, you know, it's, a, it's as big as some of the jobs I've had, it's, it still gets down to individual, you know, one-to-one -one relationships that, that really bring things and really getting guidance from pe people you learn and you trust and, and delivering and having, uh, you know, um, you know, an ability to really develop that. I think that's what's helped me most along my career journey. And, 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 and I think that that's the thing that I would, I would focus. And by the way, also when, when there's relationship breakdown, how do you repair that? I have a situation today where somebody I really, really trust and work closely with, we had a, a breakdown, probably totally my fault. And, you know, I'll be spending a, uh, <laughs> A couple of days digging out of the doghouse, but also doing it not just because uh, you know I, I think I stumbled a bit, but more because I really respect the person, uh, and and she's she's really a, a a really good colleague and somebody I trust quite a bit. So I, I'd I'd say Chandler, you know, fundamentally relationships which go across every sector, mm -hmm. health, real estate, whatever. Yeah, I would, I would piggyback on that too. I mean, you know, coming in from the brokerage and, and development side. Um, you know, while real estate is a, a massive industry that touches a lot of different, uh, you know, aspects of it, engineers, attorneys, legal, you know, it, it's crazy how many, you know, businesses are impacted by real estate in general, but uh, it really does come down to those relationships that you build. And for my career, I think the catalyst would have been, you know, starting pretty early, you know, there is a pretty long runway for projects that I work on these development and entitlement deals. Uh, can take years to go through the process. So, you know, being able to, to start projects when you're still in school and, and, you know, letting them kind of run out while you're, while you're working through that was, was a big, you know, important catalyst for me. The, the other thing is, you know, working for such a small company, you know, I never really had to focus on one particular aspect of the business. So, you know, when, when we come across a piece of land, you know, I'm not a home builder, you know, solely, you know, we work with home builders all the time, but, you know, I'm not looking at one property through one specific lens of, of one use, you know, we can pivot across the board to healthcare or, you know, assisted living, multifamily, self-storage, whatever the property may be. So, you know, being able to, you know, not, not have one set focus has given me the ability to be a generalist and kind of really, you know, kind of continue to develop where I want to focus my time. So I'm, I'm never bored with one specific, uh, you know, use and stuck to that. So, so that's, that's given me a lot of focus and, and being able to be flexible moving forward. You know, I'm going to just pat myself on the back here a little bit. And I, I'm going to say the biggest catalyst to push my career forward was myself. I, I'm going to be honest, like, I'm a little old school in my thought that I think that you need to have just a burning desire to outwork the people around you, right? And I think if you're willing to wake up early, put in the work, listen, learn, and, and put in the time, then, you know, you're, you're going to be successful in life, right? I mean, you have all these you, Instagram, YouTube, Eric Thomas, Gary Vee, you know, you can, you can watch all these one minute sound bites from all these people and they, all they talk about is dedication and discipline and, you know, the rock Dwayne Johnson. And, and, and in, re in reality, it's all true. Right. If you're willing to put in the time and effort and work, um, I, I think you're going to be successful right now. I don't want to pat myself and get too high on my own horse here. Right. I had in my young career, a couple really what I'll call uh, mentors or, you know, just people who I, I was fortunate enough to be around who epitomized that routine or epitomized that. Right. These were guys who in the construction industry or real estate industry, you know, didn't have fancy college degrees or anything else, but they were guys who were willing to, to wake up early, get to the office at 6.30 in the morning, stay till 6 p.m., you know, and then when their kids go to sleep, start working again at 10 o'clock at night till midnight. And they were my bosses. And as a young person who was trying to impress their boss, guess what? I felt like I needed to match their level of effort. So, you know, I was, you know, if they were getting in at 6.30, I was getting at 6.15. And if they were working till midnight, guess what? So was I. And, and part of that was, you know, you, you got to be a little bit self-motivated, um, but you also got to surround yourself with, you know, the relationships and, and the people around you and find those 
informal mentors. Find those people who are pushing themselves to be successful and match what, the, what they do. You know, see and learn from the people around who are successful, right? You don't necessarily need to have the plan for yourself, but see who, who is being successful in the industry that you want to be successful in and mimic them. And, and, and I think that takes a lot. So I think there's a little bit about finding, finding a mentor or finding, finding someone who, you, who you, you, you think you want to kind of be like, not saying you want to be them, um, and try to keep up, you know, try to do what they do and, 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 and do the things that I think are just blunt, hard work for force that, that I think will inevitably find success in your career by just pushing yourself to be successful. Yeah, and maybe yeah. just to maybe channel, just to add to what Michael said, you know, I think coming from my industry, there was a lot of, and you see this in banking too, right? There's this position and this position, this position, and you step and you, you, you step up. And I think what Michael said is, you, you outwork, you, you partner, you, you continue to do that. I think that's one thing. The second thing I, I would just add as another perspective is you're also going to see gaps. You know, maybe it's also because I'm in, I'm in, I've been in bigger companies and slower, not well is not one, but like Hopkins was, you know, almost quasi government a little bit to, to some extent. And you just see opportunities to do things. And, and I, I will tell you probably of my career, including the current job, seven of my 12 jobs, I wrote the job description for because I saw an opportunity. I partnered with really smart, engaged people, mentors. And I said, what if we did this? What if we did that? What do you do if you create this? And so it's that same sort of tenacious work ethic that Michael said, but a lot of times people are not seeing the outside the box opportunity. And, and, and we need to all drive value in whatever we're doing. And I think sometimes seeing that, it, it takes that energy, that same energy that Michael's talking about and saying, hey, gosh, what if we did this or what do we do? And, and you can't just say, hey, what if we do? You got to go do it. You got to go shape it. You got to lay out the plan. And th that type of energy, in addition, I think creates enormous opportunities in, in these sectors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two things, you know, I'm hearing here is, is hard work and network, right? And it's mm -hmm. sort of a, a chicken or the egg thing, right? Because you can build inertia off of a network, but... Uh, the, I think the question that maybe a lot of our listeners are thinking is, you know, how do I build out that network? Where do I start? Um, and, you know, thinking about how each of you kind of uh, got into your current positions, you know, Michael, it was, you know, one of your friends that that pulled you in um, at Blake. And then um, Mark, for you, it was, you know, your hard work at Hopkins and and uh, the CEO of Well Tower recognizing that and, and extending an offer. And then, um, Kevin, for you, it was, you know, an internship really early on. But, you know, for some of our listeners, you know, I mentioned ULI earlier. I think it's a great kind of forum for meeting people uh, in the industry. Are there any others that you can think of any kind of networking, you know, events? It could be, um, you know, net networking groups or anything like that that come to mind that people could look into to start building out their network. The good news about commercial real estate is there's no, no shortage of networking events. Everybody wants to get a beer and kind of hang out and talk after work. I mean, unfortunately, the past year has really kind of squashed a lot of that. But yeah. uh, when things do come back, um, you know, I'm a member of the Maryland Home Building Industry Association, MBIA. Um, I mean, they have weekly events. Um, you know, there's there's young leaders events that you can get involved in. ULI has actually some pretty great young leader programs, uh, which unfortunately I think I just aged out of uh, this week. But uh, you know, they, they offer you know great mentoring programs where you know you can get one-on-one -on -one time with industry leaders. Um, NAOP is another one. It's office and industrial properties. Um, so there there are a lot of options out there, and you don't have to be members of these organizations, but most of them do have you know, even student rates. I think ULI had a student rate when I was a student at Maryland. So if you've got a student ID card, you can join for pretty cheap and, you know, attend all these events in your own time. So definitely. Cool. Yeah, Michael, I would Mark. just add maybe two others because, you know, not coming, not coming from the traditional real estate side. I, I think two others. One is uh, Association of Corporate Growth is um, I started work when I came from international and started doing US-based kind of healthcare m and I didn't understand the banking nomenclature, the, the private equity nomenclature. And the beauty of real estate is it, it touches all sectors, you know? And, and so Association of Corporate Growth, I find is a group that does a lot. It's more around middle market dynamic companies 
And I think it could round out what, what Kevin shared. And then the other thing for, you know, those who are community minded, and just a great peer group is called U Emerging Leaders United. It's part of the United Way. And that's in every city in the country. So regardless of where you are, and it's just young dynamic professionals who wanna do good. Uh, a lot of the projects I'm sure we all have worked on have been university related, teach school related, nonprofit related in addition. And then all of the big companies, the banks, the other anchor institutions, all somehow are linked to these big nonprofits and the easiest group to access for people who are dynamic and energetic and wanna meet other people is, is ELU, which is part of United Way. Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pivot to um, questions from our audience. So um, first one here from uh, Stephen Glickman. Um, question is, is there an outlet to get into commercial real estate on the side, uh, parentheses, creating passive income similarly to flipping houses on the residential side? Um, or is the commercial side a full-time dedicated career? Um, so, so I'm going to take a shot at this first. Uh, okay. Michael, you want to go? No, go ahead. Go ahead first. I've got, so, got a good response though. Okay. My, so my gut my gut is telling me that uh, commercial real estate, and, and Mark, you mentioned this before, but it, it's a lot of hard work. It's long hours. Um, I, I think you have to be in it. I think you have to be in it full time to really be successful. Um, I've had friends on the brokerage side who have kind of burnt out um, trying to do stuff on the side and then kind of half being in commercial brokerage. So I think you need to be fully invested. Um, but Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're going to, I think in, you know, the <clears throat> commercial real estate, it's not a quick cash business, right? It's, it's a long-term outlet. You're not, you're not, you know, we're, and, and let me pivot here on like the flipping houses thing. I'll be honest, I do that, right? I'm a, I, I'm a full-time commercial resident, uh, commercial real estate developer, and I do investment properties and some deals and stuff on the side. And quite frankly, flipping houses becomes a full-time part-time job. I mean, you know, when I when I'm out there redeveloping a property, you know, I'm I'm going to job sites at six in the morning for an hour or two and meeting with contractors, taking phone calls throughout the day and then going back at night to check on progress. And so yeah, it's it's a tough balance. Um, and that's why it's a part-time job for me. Um, I, I think it's a struggle to think that in the commercial side that that there's a quick outlet for ex, for passive quick money or big money. I think you can find part-time jobs in commercial real estate. I mean, within construction or development or in any of these roles, you know, we hire interns, we hire part-time people all the time. So I think you can gain exposure to commercial real estate um, and make money and get paid for that. I don't necessarily think it's going to be a passive income stream or something that isn't, you know, basically just like a part-time job or internship type kind of scenario. There's no you know, I don't, I don't think you're going to find something that's some immediate fix or passive income that's going to month over month give you residuals um, uh, in that type of capacity without um, being heavily involved. Yeah. Um, the, the only other thing I would say is, uh, you know, you may be able to make passive income out of like a, call it like a shopping center, for example. Um, you will have to pay a management company uh, probably around 3% of whatever the gross rents are. Um, it, but in that way, they'll handle a lot of the day to day, the rent collection, chasing rent, that, that sort of thing. So I think it's possible, but like Michael said, it's, it's kind of a, a delicate balance. So, um, okay. So next question from Jeffrey Taylor. So, uh, what moves did you all make respectively after getting your bachelor's? Uh, for example, what did you do next? How did you forge a path to success looking back? Um, I mean this with regards to complementary knowledge, like a Series 7, Realtor's License, and initial jobs you all went for. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start. So I, I, as you guys could tell, I'm a, I like big companies. I like big brands. I uh, ran out of school. I was at Leg Mason. Then I was at J.P. Morgan. Then Hopkins. Now, now Well Tower. So I think two amazing pieces of advice that were given to me. If you're obviously in a bigger organization, you get access to it. Every single training thing known to humanity, cultural competence, leadership training, seminars on whatever. I, you know, I, I basically, you know, Hopkins helped pay for my MBA. Um, 
but all of those programs, public speaking, all that stuff I took as part of just professional development in the big, in the big company. So that I would say that's one, if you, if you like that, right? Complex organizations, not everybody loves, it's hard to get in. The, the second thing I would add is I had a great boss at JP Morgan said, your job's not to know your job, your job's to read the newspaper, be well-versed, re read books, you know, really understand what's going on in the world and in culture and things like that. And that, you know, to Michael's point earlier about work ethic, that's just as important as, you know, making phone, you really need to be well-rounded, diverse, thoughtful people. And so, you know, that that's free. It's like having a library card. You could just pick up and learn and digest all of those things. And today you got podcasts, you have seminars, you have all the, all the stuff at your fingertips. So th those are the two pieces of advice I would give. Yeah, I, I'd say I'm still a little early uh, out of my undergrad, three or four years now, um, but I do plan to go back to Maryland, uh, hopefully Maryland, and, and get my master's in real estate development um, because being a developer is my long-term goal. Um, but I'll defer to anyone else, Michael, Kevin, if you guys have anything. Uh, if not, I'll just keep moving here. Yeah, um, I, I would say too, bef before you go too far down a path of you know, specialization, you know, make sure you're, you're in a, a career path that you really do love. Um, you know, I kind of kicked around maybe going back to, or going to law school at some point or an MBA <laughs> and, you know, I probably play an attorney on TV way too much, um, you know, reading and reviewing contracts, but, um, you know, you outsource a lot of that in real estate. There's like we talked about before, there's so many specialized, uh, you know, people that are involved from engineers to attorneys if you want to have a general idea and make sure that you can, you know, kind of speak the talk, but uh, you don't necessarily need to get in the weeds and every little detail or else you'll, you'll never get out. So it's, you know, from what I do, you know, like, like Mark said, the, the generalized kind of worldviews are, are the most important thing from a day-to-day -day basis. Awesome. Um, so, so next question here um, from Warren Laney. Does a technical background like engineering confer an advantage in commercial real estate or would it be beside the point? I think I have to give that one to Michael. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I would say it's probably beside the point. Um, full transparency. I was a terrible undergrad student. I Lucky I got by at times. A lot more dedicated in my MBA, but uh, uh, I, I ran into project management because I'll, I'll be honest, I, wa I, I was not a great technical design engineer um, coming out of undergrad. And so, um, you know, it was a lot easier to get, a, you know, a project management type uh, uh, job than it was a technical design one like engineering. Now, uh, does it help? Sure, yes. I mean, I think fundamentally, it, you know, understanding the math is and the maths and the sciences a bit more. Sure, I think there's some inherent benefit to that, but I don't think that there's anything that I do on a day-to-day -day basis now that you know required my uh, technical mechanical engineering degree from background, and and to Kevin's point, you know, so many things are specialized now, whether it's on the design side, the legal entitlement side, um, or or you know whatever it may be the case. I think you you you'll you'll find in commercial real estate that a lot of people still partner with companies that specialize subcontract um, out some of these key components. So from my standpoint doing large scale commercial development in downtown DC and other parts across the country. No, I mean, all the technical design stuff, uh, we subcontract out to a, 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 design, a, a design firm that handles all that stuff for us. So um, I think it's beneficial, but no, absolutely not required. Yeah, and, and there continues to be like more entry points into commercial real estate uh, from people with different backgrounds. So for example, uh, a, another company that works in our office building uh, here in Annapolis just launched a uh, veterinary clinic real estate acquisition company. So uh, this, this guy who's kind of leading the acquisitions used to be a manager at a vet hospital nearby, partnered with a guy who has uh, capital to spend and they're working together to, uh, I think they have currently uh, uh, 10 under ownership and four more in the pipeline, but that's, that's their strategy. And to Michael's point, things are becoming more uh, specialized, more concentrated, and there's more and more specialists out there. Um, okay, so- yeah, um, Maybe, maybe uh, Chandler, just to add to that, you know, over your career, so I'm, I'm kind of the older grizzled guy on the, on the panel. And so as, you, as you, your career evolves, you pick up tools 
and you put them in your toolbox along the way, right? Some are super specialized technical, some are just experiential, some are relationships. And I think the, the longer you're in business and life, you'll realize, gosh, I learned something when I was 22 or when I was 15 or when I was 30, or I developed a relationship or a skill. And at some point that comes back to be valuable. I think with all of these things, I think the way the world is going, having expertise is great, but having flexibility and, and work ethic, flex, flexibility and vision is far more important in the way things are developing than just to be very absolute in your skill set. But, you know, you should be acquiring skills, tools, knowledge, expertise, relationships, you know, along the, along your career and you'll, you'll be using that. And, you know, at some point you won't use things and you, but you'll never say that was a waste. I don't think, I don't, I've not seen that. It's a good perspective. Um, so uh, next question from Alden Braverman to everyone. Um, I have a few questions. Thank you all so much for hosting the panel today. What are everyone's thoughts on asset valuation over the next 10 years? Do you think a shift in the interest rate will reduce borrower confidence? Do you think COVID force majeure will change risk per perception going forward? Um, so a, a few questions there, one about valuation, one about borrower confidence, um, and the other about risk perception. I, you know, my, my gut tells me, you know, right off the bat that it's, it's very much asset class by asset class. Um, it, you can't just make broad statements about uh, risk among all the real estate classes. It's, you know, right now I would say the, the top two asset classes in demand on the investor side are industrial and uh, medical office, but um, there, there's all sorts of different, you know, real estate specialties out there that, um, are going to draw attention. Um, so um, I'll defer to anyone else if, if you have comments. Let the professionals go first and then I'll, I'll say something at the end. <laughs> From the brokerage side, I, I agree with Chandler. I mean, that's that's what we're seeing is kind of the hot asset classes too. Um, you know, we work with a lot of national home builders, you know, and on the consumer side, you know, if a 30-year mortgage ticks up, you know, that eats into buying power and then they can pay less for, you know, land. So it, you know, it, it's hopefully not going to be a very quick increase, but definitely people are, are worried about that. And, you know, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out, but, um, you know, we're still seeing pretty significant, uh, you know, deal volume and interest in, in real estate because, you know, it's, um, you know, there's, there's still a lot of things happening out there. Yeah, it, there just it, there continues to be a lot of liquidity, I think, and um, real estate, you know, as a as a broader kind of asset class, continues to draw attention. So um, um, yeah. there's a, a maybe, lot of opportunity. Maybe Chandler, yeah, for you know, for us, we so we own we own a lot of medical office. Actually, I think we're the largest owner of medical office, um, definitely from a REIT perspective. So that continues to do well. Um, we bought since I've been at the company. We bought about. $4 billion in medical office. Um, and uh, there was a tiny little window when the valuation wasn't crazy that we pounced up, we were the market. And so we, we've used that to strengthen our balance sheet. This is all public information I'm sharing. But at the same time, you know, third, we, have, we're, we're, we say we're 30 billion long in, in assisted living, independent living and memory care, which is not the most pristine asset class today, right? With COVID, it's been hit. Maybe not as hard as the hotel industry or retail, but certainly quite quite um, um, hot, heavy. And our two biggest competitors, Ventas and Peak, which are the two other big healthcare REITs, are both exiting that segment. We see that this is this is a perfect example when you talk about valuations. And again, this is public. I'm not sharing anything. We see that as an opportunity. You know, you have others exiting, running from the sector. We, we think the long-term demographics in this country, I mean, I, I know you guys aren't stu studying demographics like we are, but the, the long-term demographics around aging are not going away. Um, the vaccines are working, we're rolling them out. Um, we're bullish on the future on the senior sector while everybody else is fleeing. You know, we went into skilled nursing a few years ago when nobody would touch it, it was unfinanceable. And we did a two and a half billion dollar uh, joint venture with a health system to acquire Matter Care, which was the second largest skilled nursing. You know, uh, going opposite, by the way, our chief investment officer, who's now the CEO, is really bullish on this, is a student of, of valuations and cycle and cycle time. And, 
and 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 he's very bold in in doing that. So I would just say, you know, there's there's always opportunity when you look at things from a value perspective. He's a student of Buffett and value-based real estate investing. So that's what drives our principles. On the long-term investment cycle, you know, we because we're a REIT, high dividend paying stock. So interest rate fluctuations, just like the bond market, impact us pretty significantly as well. And so lower interest rates, good, because our dividend looks attractive. Higher interest rates, a little more challenging. We have to rely on the growth and the equity value. So we, we track that stuff all the time. I think the biggest question, you know, our, our, my colleague said this, this is a long-term game. So, um, you, you know, is real, retail dead? I don't think retail is dead. Is retail struggling mightily now? Sure. Is assisted living struggling? Yeah. Um, is hospitality struggling? Yeah. If we look at over your guy's career, those are all going to rebound at some point in some different way. So, you know, that, that's at least my, you know, non real estate trained perspective. Thanks, Mark. Um, and so, Michael, I have to ask you because uh, so Blake Real Estate owns 10 office buildings in D.C. Um, office has been one of the, the trickier segments with everyone sure. working from home. Um, like how do, how do you or how does uh, the Blake team kind of think about um, the risks there? Yeah, we uh, we've put a lot of things on pause. You know, we've you know, we without trying to go too too deep down into what we were contriving and thinking about doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got some capital investments that we had thought about or planned and uh, things, uh, you know, in particular, we were very close to knocking down one of our buildings that we have in downtown DC and putting up a brand new trophy property, you know, to lease to the market and, and everything else. And all that was based around a specific anchor tenant in one of our buildings who was planning to move out. Well, guess what? They haven't moved out yet and they may not move out. We don't know yet. So, um, you know, part of what we're trying to figure out is, you know, what tenants are coming, what tenants are staying. Um, and then obviously what that means to us in terms of the investments we were going to make within our own properties. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, it's, it seems like it's a, it's, a, a, it's a moving target right now a little bit. And so I think until it stabilizes and, and it allows us to try, to try to see a clearer picture of what we think the market's going to look like, um, we'll be able to kind of get back to planning, you know, our next steps on the development side of our, of our portfolio. Um, Unfortunately, to your point on the office side, it's it's very volatile volatile right now, and so it's it's really we're you know we basically just kind of put pause on everything because we need to kind of let everything shake out before we kind of really mm -hmm. decide what we're going to do next. Yeah, so it's all you can do is kind of wait and see. I think so. Uh, TPI manages um, seven multi-story office buildings in Annapolis and Baltimore. Uh, we have uh, between like fifty-five and sixty tenants. Uh, commercial office tenants in those buildings, and um, what I've what I've kind of gleaned so far from talking to some of these businesses is that uh, they're looking at taking sort of a hybrid approach and uh, working at home part time in the office, maybe three days a week, and that in turn I think will bring down the need for you know all the space they have. So maybe some downsizings are in the work, but um, it's it's just so hard to beat the collaborative nature of uh, your traditional office space. And I, look, I'm in touch with a lot of architects, so I, I kind of get the pulse from them from the side of what the tenants that they're talking to or the clients that they're talking to. And most people are still moving forward with a lot of their projects, even if they're, the timeline of them have shifted now. Um, you know, from what I'm hearing from, from the architect design world of this, of this, of the real estate world, is people aren't really shrinking footprints. People aren't really backing out of a lot of projects. They're just shifting them further into the future. Mm -hmm. um, they still believe in, you know, the vaccine. They still believe in um, socialization, collaboration spaces, needing people to just be face to face. Um, and so, for that, you know, to your point, there may, you know, there, might there be a small reduction in footprints potentially, maybe. But really, what I've gathered is it's just more of just everything's kind of just been frozen for a period of time, or we're just trying to get unstuck. Um, not that I that not that we think that there's going to be a major shift in the marketplace. Um, in terms of tenant or tenant spaces or lease activity, it's just more about just waiting out, you know, uh, to get to a less volatile environment. 
Yeah, I think when you also look at other cyclical trends and crises like 9-11, other things that have happened, you know, with this one, our homes, our traditional homes have not been designed for us to work from them, right? Our lifestyles have not been designed to not see people for weeks on end. And I think there's going to be a thirst, um, you know, somebody who has a lot of space and I can space out of my home and it's quiet and my kids are older, I still want to go back to work, you know, uh, and I think some of that's human nature. And and a lot of the isolation and loneliness, you guys probably are not studying it as much. It's, it you know, affects the older adults more, but it also affects millennials quite a bit. And, you know, I think as we get through this and it becomes, and I don't know if that's two years, three years, five years, seven years until we get back to some reality of people engaging. Um, you know, I, I still am pretty bullish that people want to be around other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I totally agree. And, and, uh, it's going to take a while to see how things are impacted, but it's it's great perspective. Um, so next question here from uh, Richard. Um, I graduated last year with the goal of getting into commercial real estate, but then took an opportunity to learn and understand property management uh, for a small developer, 50 units. Uh, what advice do you have in transferring those skills into a big company or getting into commercial development? Um, so. So I, I think I could probably take this. I think I mentioned that I had uh, two internships with small real estate developers at Maryland. Um, one was in Pikesville, one was in Annapolis. And um, so after leaving Maryland, I, I went and worked at Cushman and then um, went to real term. And ultimately it was, it was mid last year that um, I was talking to uh, the Annapolis developer and he had recently launched uh, TPI, a new venture uh, to acquire medical office buildings up and down the East Coast. Um, so really just by staying in touch with him um, and keeping up with him, it was through that relationship that I was able to kind of learn about the opportunity when I saw a job description come out last year. And uh, I, I think just his, it was only a three month internship, but that familiarity was really what set me apart in, in a pretty uh, a large candidate pool. So, um, and, and that's another thing about real estate, like uh, from what I've seen, the positions are getting more competitive. I think Michael, you mentioned this on the development side, you know, you just don't need a lot of people to be development managers. You just need one good one. So um, it's, it's competitive, but I think that, you know, to Richard's point that that can become a bigger opportunity over time as people kind of acquire more assets um, more assets under management. It, it, so, you know, keep a good relationship, don't burn any bridges and, and, um, and look out for the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Relationships is pivotal, right? I, I work for a developer because the president of my company was one of my fraternity brothers, right? And they had a project in a need and he called me and said, Hey, we're going to hire you. Okay, here we go. And so, um, you know, I, I think, what I would encourage everyone on this call to do is, is just is to continuously network and, and you never know who's going to be uh, a, a valuable relationship, right? One of our, one of our other fraternity brothers, and, and I'll say, I'll, I'll bring up my fraternity just because I, to this day, I still do business in many different ways with many of my different brothers. He got a job out of undergrad selling office supplies and like printers and everyone laughed at him. Right. And that's it. And, and it was just like, you're, you're selling printers. Like that's what you're doing. And here he is, you know, 15 years later, still selling printers. But guess what? Every office space and every tenant that moves into one of my buildings, guess what they need? A printer. So guess what I do? I introduce him <laughs> to all. And, and, he, and, and, and so there's networks and relationships that you may not realize and the value of them immediately, and, and they, but they become valuable over a long period of time. So I just encourage everyone to continuously, you know, just, just meet people, treat people with kindness and respect, grow your network, grow connections, because you never know where it's going to come back. And particularly in the commercial real estate space, you know, um, you know, Kevin and I had never met, you know, until this panel and, and, and some of the practice we had before this, but me and him know dozens of the same people and have done business with dozens of the same people and just hadn't known that because we had never really met each other prior to that. And you'll realize very quickly that the commercial, or, you know, the residential real estate space as a whole is actually a pretty small community and everyone does business with each other. So yeah, just continue to work, network, continue to make relationships um, and, and utilize them to your advantage. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would so, just also add we're increasingly, you know, we're really a financing mechanism, right? We're the capital partner behind owning existing stabilized assets and owning others. We, we have, since I've been at the company, we have about four people, including five people, including myself, who really were on the customer facing side. So we own a lot of assets with health systems. They wanted somebody who understood health systems. That's how I got my job. We have two people who ran assisted living communities and their insight has allowed us to do things we wouldn't have done because we understand what the boots on the ground people deal with. Now, those people had to make career decisions and move from being an operator into being part of the investment arm, but they've been fascinated by the opportunity. So, you know, even if you're, if you're a customer facing, that's amazing knowledge that somebody's gonna wanna leverage later if you're bold enough to figure out how to make the transition. Yeah. Um, I, so I think we have time for uh, one more question here and, and all of our panelists knew this one was coming. So um, if you listen to any Tim Ferriss podcasts, um, he always asks this question to people who come on. So, um, but you know, for everyone here, so if you could put anything on a billboard that, um, you know, all, all Terps could see, maybe everyone here. Um, so people who are looking to break into real estate or excel in real estate, it, it could be a word, a quote, a phrase, you know, something that distills your experience down. Um, what would you put on that billboard? I'll, I'll hand it off to anyone who wants to speak first. Um, I'll go ahead and just kind of piggyback on that last uh, discussion too. I mean, I think what I would put on there is your reputation precedes you. Um, you know, like everybody said, you know, it, it, real estate's a big industry, but it's a very small community at the same time. And, and you know, people will, will find out if you're screwing somebody out of a deal or if you, you're not an honest person, it, it gets around quick. And uh, it's a very uh, incestuous and, and revolving door as well. So, you know, if you're working with somebody at one company, um, you know, they could be at the next company that you come across, uh, you know, weeks later. And, and um, people do move around a lot because there is a lot of opportunity. But um, yeah, I, I would just, uh, I would caution that. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, this has been great. Um, I would love to uh, get all your thoughts on uh, the billboard. Um, just one, one word, one quote, one phrase, if you have it. Good, Michael. Uh, uh, when I was little, my mom gave me this little plaque, and I still think it, it weighs to my first commentary at the very beginning of this. And, and the little plaque that she gave me, it said, some succeed because they're destined to, but most succeed because they're determined to, right? It's uh, Henry Van Dyke, I believe, is the guy who, who authored the quote. Uh, but it goes in my commentary earlier. You got it, the commercial real estate, Real estate as a whole is it's a long value add field. Nothing really becomes overnight. You've got to be in it for the long run. Um, deals take years to come together. Developments take years to come together and then years to build. So everything is it's it's a slow moving battleship a lot of times. So you just got to be willing to work through it. Um, you got to be willing to to put in the the effort. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it with that little quote that uh, I, I has been my little kind of career mantra. Yeah, bo both of those are, are spot on. And to Kevin's point, I was with a big uh, construction group yesterday, started the meeting by saying, we called our Hopkins friends to see if you are what you say you are. And they said, we can, we should do some stuff with you guys. I, I had no idea that would happen. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud about my experience here. I, I would just, you know, if it's a billboard, I would leave it to Christine. I, I think some play on the turp and the turtle shell. We talked about this. You, you need some thick skin. You know, sometimes you need some armor, there's shrapnel out there in the business world. I feel like I've lost limbs on big deals. I feel like right now I'm getting beat up a little bit for something I stumbled across. And you got to be resilient. Maybe it's around resilient and tenacity. But, you know, it, it's this is a, you know, business world, healthcare, real estate, all of it. It's hand to hand combat. You have to have good relationships and you have to be tough. And sometimes you're going to get knocked down and you got you to scrape yourself off the ground and, and keep moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you guys crushed it on the word count. Uh, I would just end it with patience. You know, it's, it's, you guys said it, it's a long-term game and you just have to be patient. Um, so uh, appreciate, you know, all of your time. Uh, thank you, Christine and, and the alumni association. Um, thanks to our panelists for being so generous and, and um, 
all the participants will get an email after this with our LinkedIn information, contact information. Uh, so if you're looking to make a jump into real estate and we can help, you know, feel free to reach out um, and stay safe out there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you.